Okay, well, moving right along into the afternoon, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Lori Williams, who will introduce her panel entitled Alternative Financing for Your New Venture. Lori is the owner of LW & Associates, a consulting firm specializing in strategy and finance. In 2007, she founded Business Simply Put, a division and registered trademark of LW & Associates to provide smaller companies with affordable, high-level information and advice. Lori has held positions in marketing with Canon Incorporated, functioned as a turnaround CEO for a medical products distribution company, and worked for a regional bank as vice president of commercial banking. She holds an MBA from Pepperdine, a bachelor's in science degree in business and management, uh, an associate's degree in medical science, and a practitioner's license in neuro-linguistic programming. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Lori Williams. Thank you, and I'm very excited to be here today. You know, one of the challenges that new and small companies face is how do I get funding? I'm sure many in the audience are here asking that same question. For startups and many companies, a traditional bank line is not an option. So today, our panelists are going to talk about different funding that is available and introduce some that you may not be aware of. So with that, let me first introduce our panelists. Steve Block is an entrepreneur and also involved in angel investing. Fred Gaylord is involved in factoring and invoice financing. And Marianne Leonardo is involved in asset-based lending. You may notice from the introductions that I might have already said words that you have never heard before. And that is the purpose of this panel, is to introduce funding that you may not be aware of. So with that, we're going to start with Steve and ask, what type of companies do you work with, Steve, and in what capacity? We work, excuse me, I am, uh, as an angel investor, uh, and I work with startup companies, meaning companies that can be either pre-revenue or just in revenue. Uh, I'm a member of something called Tech Coast Angels, which is the largest angel investing group in California. Uh, we have over 300 members in five chapters. But we, we are, we're sort of in industry agnostic in what, we, uh, what we're interested in. Um, but we're more, we'll be primarily done, I guess, high tech, uh, biotech, digital media, and consumer products, very interestingly. It's been it's kind of a big, broad mix. Um, what do I look for? In, what, what do I look for? Or what do we look for? We look for entrepreneurs who are, and these, these are key words, passionate, committed, and I'll talk about what I mean by commit, committed in, in a minute, and I don't mean committable. Um, <laughs> coachable and flexible, good listeners, uh, and uh, uh, willing, you know, sort of creative. I think creativity is really very important. Um, the, the importance, the, the, how should I say this? You know, the panel this morning said it best. Uh, I believe, um, what was her name? Catherine, I think, said, you are the product sell yourself and that's what you've got to do to get funding anywhere but particularly from angel investors and vcs which is the next step down the down the chain which we'll I'll talk about in a, a briefly um uh, what we how we how we do things is as follows you submit an application uh in which you describe your business you and your business and your business team um, that application is pre-screened by a panel that has domain expertise in the area in which your uh, business falls. Uh, that panel decides whether you are ready to go to another round, into a larger screening, uh, whether you need more seasoning, or whether in fact this is the kind of business that we as angels won't fund at all. I mean, things like we don't, even how good, no matter how good they are, we won't fund movies, or entertainment adventures like that. Um, but we fund, I mean, funding is very difficult. We have funded, let me give you numbers. We have funded over $100 million to over 175 companies during our last 10 years of, or 12 years now of, of existence. Um, those companies have received almost $1.2 billion in follow-on financing from VCs and others. 
Now, given that number, you'd think we fund a lot of companies. Uh, the truth of the matter is, we fund probably about one and a half to three percent of the companies we see. So it really takes a talented or unusual entrepreneur or an unusual idea that will grab our attention. Uh, obviously, we're looking for companies that have some unique, uh, unique uh, product or, or expertise uh, that uh, is dis disruptive of its technology, disruptive technology. Uh, that really moves the industry that they're involved with well beyond where it is today, um, and uh, uh, is uh, you know it has a potential to grow into a, a larger venture. I mean, we like to say that we we like to get uh, ten times our money back in five to seven years. I can tell you right now that it doesn't happen. <clears throat> we probably are lucky to get five times our money back in ten years. If and that's only. Uh, from a small percentage of the ventures we, we, we fund. Even though we only fund one and a half to three percent of the companies that see us, of those companies, probably 35 to 40 percent just outright fail. Uh, another 30 percent uh, muddle along and, and, and may, you know, make a little bit of money but just end up uh, either, either being bought out or, or dissolving and giving your investors back exactly what they invested or slightly less or more. There's another group of a 10% or 15% that is, uh, uh, will give you a return of five or four to five, per, four to five times your money. Uh, there, are, there are home run deals. We've had several of them. As a matter of fact, we had one that closed at the, in the end of 2010. Uh, it's called, it was called Green Dot, which is the largest purveyor of prepaid debit cards. It's a company we funded 10 years ago and our investors made approximately 110 times their money. My best friend was the lead in that deal, and I can tell you that she parlayed about 150,000 into about 18 million. So there are, there's money to be made, and that's why we're in the game. But we also have become much more, much more discriminating over the years about what we do. Uh, and we're demanding more and more from our investors. I'll, we can talk about more of this uh, as we go through. Well, continuing with what Steve said, one and a half to three percent of the deals that he sees gets funded, and then you can do the math on the amount of people that are not going to see Steve. You already are asking, well, what about the others? So as we continue with the panel, Fred's involved, as I said, with factoring and invoice financing. He's going to tell you about what that involves. And so may I ask you the same question, Fred? What type of companies do you work with and in what capacity? Well, we work with uh, startup companies, which I presume there's a lot of you in the room that are. Lori also mentioned about factoring, uh, maybe a word that not too many people are familiar with. Show of hands. Who knows what factoring is about? About three or four. OK. Um, it, it's probably one of the oldest forms of financing around. Started out in 1607. Uh, when uh, uh, the Mayflower came over from England and they started making uh, clothing, but they needed product to make clothing. So consequently, they sent agents over that would determine as to um, whether or not the, the folks who wanted the, the material to make the clothing was credit worthy enough to, uh, to get it. And that's eventually how factoring evolved. And um, it... Uh, it's a, it's a form of financing, but besides the financing, we do the credit, the collections, and all the bookkeeping that's involved with the accounts receivable, in addition to advancing against accounts receivable. So in, in other words, we'll finance companies who have accounts receivable. So you give us paper, we give you money. So that's basically how the, how the factoring works. The company that I worked for is 204 years old. I only started working for them three years ago, not, not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're headquartered in the United Kingdom, so they are a British company. Um, we're in the United States. Uh, we have about, uh, I would say, four, we're actually in 14 different countries, including United States and Canada. Uh, the company, the the office that I work for is in Westlake uh, Village, and that's uh, everything west of the Mississippi. 
And the type of customers that we're looking for, or type of clients that we're looking for, are basically startups, entrepreneurs. And the criteria for us would be you have to have accounts receivable. So which means you have to have some revenue and sales in order to apply with us. And then I think uh, that other question is going to come later as to what is required. And we do have an application. When that question comes, I'll, I'll go into that in more detail. But uh, the type of customers that, or industries that uh, we look for, basically apparel textile is, uh, is the main industries because that's the ones that started with the factoring many moons ago. Uh, however, it has evolved to where anywhere where we can get a bead on the credit of the customers, the end users, we will factor those accounts. So we're looking pretty much at all industries not only manufacturers, distributors, importers, uh, those type of companies, but we also look at service companies, depending on who you're selling. So it's, it's a way of outsourcing your accounts receivable to a professional third party, us, to handle that end of, it, that end of your accounts receivable and your financing for you at a fixed cost. And it's... Um, it's a, it's a very basic type of uh, thing is that when you ship, we advance 80%. When the customer pays, we get the 20% back. You then get the 20% less whatever our charges are. So basically that's how factoring, uh, factoring works. Wonderful, Fred. Great information. Marianne, in continuing with the same question on asset-based lending, which I would assume with the same show of hands, you might get a similar response knowing what those words mean. Can you tell us what type of companies you work with and in um, a capacity also as it is different from what Fred does and Steve does to kind of bring it all together for the audience too? Okay. Thanks, Lori. Um, I do what is called ABL lending, asset-based lending, and I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Um, when I say I do that, a lot of people say, would well, you lend against real estate? Absolutely not. We don't get involved in real estate at all. What we do is similar to a bank line of credit. However, we are a non-bank. We deal with companies in the lower end of the middle market with sales between two and probably 80 million. Um, we are probably the next step. They will start with the VC, then they may go to the factor once they have created receivables. Or prior to that, they may do, we don't want to talk about this, but PO financing, um, since neither one of us does a lot of that, where they have a contract and they're bringing the stuff in and then they're going to create the receivable. Okay, what, what I do is two steps above that. I will take a company who has receivables and inventory um, and lend against, advance against that. I will not buy the receivable, but I will use it as a source of collateral so that I can unlock the value in their trading assets. Um, so for example, we do lines of credit, revolving lines of credit between half a million and five million. And for most companies in the lower end of the middle market, that is their target zone in terms of uh, working capital needs. Sometimes they'll come to me and look for what we call a term piece on machinery and equipment. Um, that's not something our group, Gibraltar, does, but we do have partners that partner with us and, and do something like that. Um, we get um, a lot of our referrals from banks themselves in two different ways. Um, we get referrals from banks like Wells Fargo and Bank of America, U.S. Bank, that are out there calling on entrepreneurs, and they come to me and say, Marianne, you know, they've only been in business a year. They haven't shown profits yet. Um, they look like they have a really solid product line. They've got some good receivables. Can we house them with you? And then when they're ready to move on, uh, we'll do the deposit side of the business, we'll do their real estate, we'll do payroll, and then will you hand them off to us on the credit side when our credit people are interested and feel they're mature enough for a bank, an actual bank line of credit. So that is where a lot of our business comes from. We also get referrals from bankruptcy attorneys, turnaround people who are looking at companies that perhaps had a bank line, might even have a bank line, and the bank is asking them out. Um, we are sort of, a, I want to say, a halfway house for those companies until they become bankable again, start showing profits, uh, start delevering, um, you know, doing all the things that the, the advisors have told them to do. 
So that is the range and type of companies we work with. Uh, the company I work for, Gibraltar Business Capital, is a very old company, about 30 years old. However, we took a turn. We were originally a factoring company. And a year and a half ago, um, one of the owner's sons bought the company with a gentleman from Foothill Capital, who is a very large player in the ABL market. Um, and we have two investor groups. So the way that we fund our deals is through two means. Um, the equity that we have brought in from the investor groups in Pasadena and Dallas. And we also have what we call a rediscount line with Wells Fargo. That is uh, a substantial line of credit that we can offer to companies that the bank won't do. We buy the money from Wells, mark it up, and then uh, fund their deals. So that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Um, and um, typically, when you're looking at a situation with a company, we look at all industries. Most of the deals have a story to them. So we are looking very carefully at the collateral to make sure that the receivables are turning. And in the case of inventory, um, receivables will generally advance 85 to 90% against. Um, with the inventory, we're more aggressive than most lenders, but um, on an average, we're doing 25 to 50% against inventory. And often, we have to have a appraisal that indicates the value, the liquidation value of the inventory before we move ahead and assign a value to that. Um, the way we structure our pricing is a little different than factoring. We are structuring it more like a bank. We're charging um, an interest rate on the funds that are borrowed. Uh, we also have some other unique pricing features that ABL uses and all of the houses use it, whether it's Gibraltar at the low end or Wells Fargo Business Credit or PNC at the higher end. And that involves a uh, collateral management fee. Usually it's a set fee per month. And there is usually a closing fee um, also associated with the deal. Can I just make one more comment? When you get to them, either one of them, you're going to have revenue, you're going to have receivables, you're going to have inventory. Angels will fund companies that are just ideas. Um, that is becoming less, light, less, less uh, uh, common because of the fact that uh, VCs have moved downstream as well and are funding later stage companies. Uh, and the recession of 2008 has, has really upset the entire uh, capital market for uh, angels and VCs. But if you don't get money from us, unless you have another source, you don't ever get to them. Uh, so I mean, I, it's a it's yes. a different it's a different concept, uh, but I think your first stop, other than your friends and family money, is people like us. And unfortunately, a lot of times your credit card too, as I've seen yes. as being oh, a yeah. consultant well, many years in in the business. Yeah. Um, but with that, with the next question, I want to give you the background of why I created the question the way I did and what I'm looking for. As a strategy finance consultant and interim CFO for 20 years, I have I can make some kind of generalizations. And what I've noticed is a lot of companies that I come into, they really don't have strong financial backgrounds with some of the people in the company. So you could say that they may lack some financial sophistication. One of the aspects that I know from being in the finance world is each company, be it factoring, asset-based lending, and even angel investing, they're looking for a certain documentation. They're looking for a certain way to communicate with them. They're looking for certain ways to interact. I've gotten involved with companies that say, well, let me just pull off my little you know, notes here and we'll take it to the meeting. And that was not what they were looking for. And that has actually harmed them in some way because it creates the relationship relationship where they're not, the companies they're going to for funding aren't as comfortable or confident in the numbers. So with that in mind and where I was going, I'm going to ask each of the panelists, um, what does a business owner need to know or do when working with your company? And I'm starting that with you, Steve. Okay. First, first of all, um, we, we, we basically discount numbers completely because we're starting, we're talking about companies that are really just starting out. They have no real way of knowing how much they're going to make or how much they're going to, how much revenue they're going to have and how much income they're going to create. Um, so uh, we see the fit, we have, we have what we call or we see what we call the famous hockey stick, which is 
for the first year or two, the company will say, well, our revenues will be 500,000 the first year, a million the second year, and by the third year, we're going to be 10 million, and in the fourth year, we're going to be 50 million. Well, that just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at all. Uh, and we, if you think it's going to happen, that's a negative for us. I think people have to be realistic, aggressive, but realistic in their projections of revenue to, to get angel money. You have to have credibility. Credibility is probably the most important thing you need for us. And I, we were talking, joking about credit cards. Uh, the other thing you need to do, and part of the commitment I was talking about, is we say you need to have mortgaged your house to the hilt, and you need to have maxed out all your credit cards, and you need to have borrowed from everybody in your family and all your friends before you come to us. Now, that's, a, that's an overstatement, but there is, there is some truth to the, to, the, to the idea that you really do have to show that financial skin in the game, uh, have put your own money in the, in the, uh, in the venture. And there, there are too many entrepreneurs who come to us, even successful ones, six, ones who are, who are serial entrepreneurs who are doing a second venture, who have really put only a small amount of money, even though they may have made a, a lot of money on their first venture. And that we review those skeptically. But for us, first of all, you need to make a, you need to be very, very good at what you do. And I mean good at what you do, presenting your ideas. Clear, concise, uh, convincing. Uh, we don't look at business plans. So business, and I don't view business plans as valuable for any investor uh, uh, at all, because no VC will look at them. They just get too many deals. Angels get, we get a thousand or more deals uh, a year that we, uh, um, uh, that we see. And we have to sort of go through to determine how much, which ones we want to see more of and which ones we ultimately want to fund. Um, so what we look for is, the, is important, a two to four page executive summary of your business uh, with, with some sort of summary projected financials. Now we, as I said, we discount them, but we like to see what they mean. Uh, that, that uh, or what, what you think they're gonna be. And you, you wanna say what you do, how you're gonna go to market, uh, what your revenue model is, um, uh, who your competition is, what you're gonna do with the money that you get from us, and most important for the investor is, how are you going to get out of the business? Because we don't get paid until there's an exit or a liquidation event. Uh, and so we're looking always toward who's going to buy you if you're going to get acquired. And don't ever go into an to a angel or a VC today. Maybe a VC, but certainly don't go into any angel uh, investor and say you're going to do an IPO. It isn't going to happen. Although the irony is this company I just told you about Green Dot was an IPO, but it's, it's probably one out of the 5,000 that will do an IPO, and we know that. Uh, so which kinds of companies will acquire you? Why would you be of interest to them? Uh, that's the ultimate thing that we want to know. Um, if you have IP, it helps, but the truth of the matter is we do a lot, most deals that are we call execution plays only, that we're not, we're not uh, relying on IP. A lot of people come to us and they have, oh, process and methods patents, and they're filed them, well, the, and particularly software stuff. The truth of the matter is, while those things, we thought the Supreme Court was gonna kick those out a year and a half ago, and surprisingly, they kept them in. But um, we, we, don't, we don't put any stock in methods and process patents because they're too easy, for those of you who understand the IP concept or the software and hardware world, they're too easy to work around. You make a few changes, and, uh, and, you can, and you can work around the patent and you, you're, you're free and clear. Uh, so we, we look at execution and that, uh, an execution risk, and that has two factors to it. One, it's obviously the business, the competition, um, the unique position you have in the business, uh, if you've got something that's important or that's, uh, that's uh, disruptive, and uh, also, excuse me, uh, the, uh, how do I say it, the, um, uh, what your, what your competitors can do. In other words, if you're, in a, if you're going into an industry which has a big gorilla in it, uh, and that big gorilla is just as capable as you are of doing what you're doing, you've got to have a pretty good reason for thinking that, for justifying why that, per, that big gorilla isn't going to do it, but would like to acquire you rather than do it on its own. And there are, there are things which are technologically or, or uh, uh, strategically uh, different enough from the core business of the customer 
uh, that would, or the gorilla that would make the gorilla interested in, in the startup. Um, when you when you present, let me just let's say something else. You're going to end up if you get past the pre-screening, you're going to go to a screening. That is a 15-minute opportunity to make your case. What you're going to see this afternoon, by the way, is 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 a fast pitch. I judge these all the time, uh, uh, and, and and the key is they're 60 seconds, and we call we call them elevator pitches. I mean, theoretically, that's what you want to tell somebody you meet for the first time in an elevator when you've got a captive audience about what your business is and make that person want to take another meeting with you. You're not trying to get funded from a fast pitch. You're not trying to get funded from, a, from even the 15-minute pitch. What you want to do is generate interest, excitement about you. So you want to make your, your business sound as, as exciting and as unique as, it possibly can, as you possibly can. Uh, so I so said, we don't, we don't read business plans. What's very important is the, the executive summary and a PowerPoint presentation. That has become the new business plan for angels and VCs. Uh, those slides, for us, for a 15-minute presentation, you try, to keep, you try to keep the slides to, say, 12 to 15 slides. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I advise is not to cram information on a slide and don't read the slide. That's the worst thing you can do. I mean, I can read your slide. That's not what you're telling me anything. The slide is a takeoff point. It, it allows you to expand on what the few words that are on the slide. I like to say no more than four bullet points on a slide, uh, and each one has to be 24 point type or more, um, uh, and maybe even three. Uh, but uh, you'll get much more attention and you'll get much more interest if you can expand on what you've written. Uh, the, the, the kinds of businesses that we, that we like, I mean, I have several, one, well, I have a rule, two rules that we, we sort of follow. First of all, I was interested because, uh, what was her name this morning? I, I'm very bad at Hillary, I think was her name. Uh, was there a Hillary here? That's right. Yeah. yeah. She started with her husband, I believe, her ex-husband. We do not like husband and wife teams as entrepreneurs for that very reason. We will fund them from time to time. But we don't like them. We've had too many bad experiences with things like divorce, which disrupt the business. Um, and the, the other thing we, um, we really don't, uh, don't like particularly is, uh, I lost my train of thought here. We don't like husband and wife teams, and we don't like, well, I'll think of it, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the, you have, what do you have to have in the way of your business? How far do you have to have advance to get, to get funding? I'll give you two minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay. You want to do. You want to. You want to have at least a proof of concept. If you have a. If you have a, a prototype, that's that's very helpful. If it's a. If it's a product, and if you have some minimal revenue that proves that you have interest, that the dogs will eat the dog food, as I think somebody said this morning, that is also very very critical. We'll talk about more of this later. Thank you. Um, Fred, can you walk us through all the way from the documentation that you would need to look at when you're viewing the company to the documentation that the company would be responsible for if they would get funded? Sure. Um, ours, ours is pretty simple. Um, as I had mentioned uh, previously, if you've got accounts receivable, that is our main look. We want to make sure that the customers that you're selling are credit worthy. It's really that simple. So we do credit checks on those customers and determine whether or not we can advance money against those invoices. That's the main thing that we look at when you come to us. Sure, we have an application. Your name, where you've been, what your credit history is, that type of thing. We're interested in not only the company's credit, but the credit behind the company, which would be the owner of the company. So it's very important that you have a decent credit history, no tax liens, no judgments, no suits. You know, we look at those kind of things. Uh, but the main collateral that we're looking for are those accounts receivable. So if you come to us with a, a good list of accounts receivable, I would say 90 to 95 percent you're going to get funded. And uh, as far as how many accounts, uh, we have 5,500 clients, 5,500 clients uh, throughout the world. We're located in 14 countries. So uh, if you are shipping out of the country into uh, 
other countries, we can factor or advance money against those invoice, invoices also. So it's a, it's a worldwide type of thing. As you go up the ladder a little and you become a little more um, uh, two, three years in business, you're now doing more volume, you're, you're going beyond the $100,000 credit line, we then would want to see things like a financial statement um, and uh, more type of financial type of information. So, but a factor, the main thing is the accounts receivable. You have to look at that. So once, once, we, ha once we determine that uh, you're good to go, um, and the and the customers are, are are good, and that we can uh, advance against those uh, invoices. We then have a contract that we give you that um, is all in our favor, and <laughs> <laughs> not in your favor. And that's because, as I had mentioned earlier, is that you're going to give us paper and we're going to give you money. So as long as that scenario stands, it's got to be in my favor. So that's that's basically how we work. One of the things I'm happy about is my goal of this panel when I first talked with Doug about putting together is I said, I want honesty. I want people to hear what's really the truth out there that a lot of them don't know, and I think we're succeeding in that. Um, one point that I, I want to make on what Fred was talking about, and just from a situation analysis, you know, once again, going back from my years of consulting, um, sometimes I've been with companies where they are, have certain clients that, you know, everybody wants somebody to pay in 30 days. That's our goal. But you get involved with certain corporations, they're not going to pay for 90, 180 days. And basically, unfortunately, the deal is, do you want to work with me? Yeah, you're going to get your payment in 180 days. Obviously, a new company can't run with that kind of cash flow. But it's not that they really need any kind of investor. They don't need to give away the company. They just need cash to run in, you know, their operations before collections. So that's where um, options like this become available. You know, obviously, you're going to be giving away some profit for that. And that is your only option. And the one thing that I'm very strong with clients when we use it, we say, yes, this is an option. It's keeping us going. It's getting the cash. Watch the profit margins because you have to budget for it. So I just want to tie in a little bit to a situation of when this would be an option and a benefit to the company and how to look at it internally from a finance perspective. So with that, Marianne, in asset-based lending, can you walk us through what you would be looking for prior to, you know, sure. to the deal and then what you would be looking for within the relationship? Um, when someone comes to me or calls me with a situation, um, it might be a referral source, an attorney, a CPA, a bank. Um, it might be a turnaround person and says, I have a company, a uh, PE, a private equity sponsor, um, that needs a line of credit, a senior secured line of credit. And what I will do is talk to the owner. I like to talk to the owner directly. I think from our point of view, um, we are not taking a personal guarantee on the transactions we do. We are often taking a validity guarantee, which means they attest to the veracity of the numbers. Um, because of that, I like to talk to the owner or the borrower directly. And pretty much what I ask for are four pieces of paper to start out. That is a receivable aging, a payable aging, an inventory run if they want inventory to be part of the deal, um, an executive summary, and some recent financials. We'd like to get two years of financials with interims. We don't always get that. Um, but we are more of a balance sheet lender. While we are taking collateral, obviously, and tying the availability of the loan to that collateral, we are a balance sheet lender. We are pre-bank, and once they get to the bank, the bank's not only going to want financials, they're probably going to want reviewed and audited financials. We are lucky to get compiled with notes. We feel very fortunate if we can get that. Um, for a lot of companies, particularly those that are under 20 million in sales, reviewed statements are very expensive, even with regional accounting firms. So we don't demand it. We are willing to work with them on statements that they produce um, from uh, perhaps a, a local CPA or somebody, um, and then also work with their interim statements. Um, however, something that we find over and over again, most really successful entrepreneurs have a very strong sales background and marketing background. Um, occasionally, you get someone who has a financial background. But it's usually the person with the marketing and sales background 
um, that has an idea, that can really move that idea through channels, um, can get the kind of customers that we want to see on the receivable aging. That's the kind of person that we're working with, particularly with the young companies. In that case, I always try to tell them it's not money wasted to try to get a good advisor, either financial and or legal, in there from the early you know, part of your company once you start creating those receivables. There's lots of qualified people that will work part time and advise them before they maybe have the money to take on a, a CPA firm. Uh, but it, it just always is a, it pays off because when I get a package and I look at a wide variety of industries, the clearer that package is, the more concise it is, uh, the less I have to go back and forth with the owner to ask for additional information, the faster we can get that thing funded. Or at least I can get an answer for them if we can't fund it. Um, something that you probably know from your studies or your work, if you're an entrepreneur and you have that passion, you want to talk about your business all day long. And that is the type of person that we're looking for because we do want to be involved with that kind of uh, successful individual. However, to get something funded, it's really nice to have that one or two page executive summary where I can get it, I can go through that, I can understand your business quick oh quick so I can go into my underwriter and say, look it, this is how this works. This is who their target market is, this is how they bill, this is how they collect. Um, this is where they're going, and this is where they fit into their industry. Um, and then I have the agings to show them the technical aspects that they need in order to structure the proposal letter. Um, so that's something that I myself, in working with groups of entrepreneurs and, and trying to get these businesses funded, um, I'm in the field. I see the business. The underwriter is back in Chicago. He doesn't see it. My boss doesn't necessarily always see the business. So it's important for me to carry the business owner's story back to them because we're dealing with businesses, quite frankly, that probably aren't making money, um, that may have positive EBITDA, may not. So, but they have a great story, they have a great future, and they need to get money to move to the next level. And, and so that's what my job is, is to bring that story and, and to put it in a format that somebody who's looking at maybe 100 deals a day on his desk is going to give my deal that priority to let's see what we can do for this uh, you know, individual and get this going. Marianne, I'm really glad that you spoke to the necessity of the integrity of the numbers. I can't tell you how many times I've seen companies just print out what's in QuickBooks and send it in the package without reviewing how the data looks. And there might be some journal entry, something on there that they didn't fix. And then right away, it brings a question to the underwriters. Right. And right. right from there, yeah, then everything you, then starts. you a big bottleneck, and, oh, and you yeah. have to go back. You know, the clearer it is, and I try to avert that myself because I do a preliminary review of everything, and I have an underwriting background as well as a marketing background. So if I see something, I'll go back to the owner right away and say, look, this doesn't tie into this, and we need to make this work, you know, so tell me what's going on here. And usually there's a very good reason, and, you know, they may not have closed out their books, or there mm -hmm. might be something going on that you don't know, or they may just not understand it and not have a good financial person on board yet. So, yeah. And that's what I find. A lot of times, you know, people aren't trying to pull something off. They just don't know. But then it right. begins a questionable behavior, and your chance of getting funded decreases. So that's wonderful news to know. What we're going to do from here is open up questions in the audience. Is there microphones, or do we just anything specific? We're good. No. OK, wonderful. So anybody who has a question, and if it's to someone specific, let them know who you'd like to talk to specific. Or to the entire panel. And we'll repeat the question so yeah. that the rest okay. of the audience can hear. I just want to make a plug. I'm here representing the Small Business Development Center. So kind of like Marianne, uh, we have a network of business advisors that can uh, help you put together your pitches, uh, put together your financial packages. Um, so if, let's say you are going to be presenting to angel investors. Uh, you know, what does that look like? What does your pitch look like? Uh, this is all at no cost. Uh, we're funded through the SBA. It's resources that are available to you already with your tax dollars. Uh, we have locations all through LA. Um, and then the other thing is um, we partner with the World Capital Conference and we uh, like to invite our clients to go and see these, uh, 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 these people pitch their businesses to get ideas and get critique because they, they have a panel of, of, uh, of uh, professionals and experts in the area that can give them direct feedback on what they're doing wrong with their pitches. So I have information on that if you guys are interested. 
You know, and I second that the SBDC is a great resource. I sit on the board of one of the SBDCs and been around them for a long time, and they are free and no charge and can help get financials together. And the Growth Capital Conference is actually a very valuable resource. The biggest problem for people like me is that you have to be there at 7.30 in the morning to, <laughs> to start. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. In the back. Hi, uh, this is uh, from Mr. Block. I've heard over and over again about exit strategies, so I'm just wondering, are dividends outdated? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are your exit strategy, like every time uh, I hear about angels or VCs, like they always want you to have an exit strategy. Who is this company you're going to eventually sell to? Right. All this stuff. Whatever happened with profit sharing and the profits of the companies, is They're, that old school? Is that we're not, because we're looking, we're, we're, we're high risk investors. We invest at a very early stage before we have any idea whether the business is going to be successful. Um, we are not looking simply to share in the profits of an ongoing business. We want a chunk return, which means we expect the company to be sold or, if possible, do an IPO. Uh, if you want to give intermediate distributions, that's fine. Uh, but it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't take away from the fact that we, we expect the exit. And if you, wanna, if you don't have an exit strategy or you don't want to exit, we call that running the business as a, um, uh, as a lifestyle business. Uh, you're, you're, the, you're the entrepreneur. You're going to be there forever. You earn a nice living. And you may pay us some dividends once in a while. But that's not the kind of investment we're looking for. Okay. Mr. Wong, what is the No, well, you're going to be negotiating leverage with, with me anyway. Um, the biggest, and let me, you, you raised a good question. The, the, I mean, the, we're, I say that facetiously. I wasn't, I wasn't being, being literal when I said mortgage your house to the hill, max out your credit cards. You want us to be in a position where we really need you to that. No, I, I'd rather you came to us when you didn't need us as much. Because then that means you already have some, some capital that you're working with, and we add, we, we're expansion capital, or we're something down the line. But most people come to us before they have any other, uh, any other uh, source of funds other than their friends and family. Uh, so it's really part of the commitment that we want to see. I mean, it's, it's, I was really being facetious, so don't take it seriously. I mean, we do want to see you have skin in the game. That is the most important thing. Uh, if you if you have a more if you can, if your house is worth a million dollars and you have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage on it and you're coming to me for five hundred thousand dollars why haven't you put a, another two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars on your house first uh, we wonder that is that what kind of commitment is that is that what kind of commitment do you have to your business what kind of confidence do you have in your business that it's going to succeed if that if 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 you haven't done that so that's really what we're looking for. I'm just wondering, Mr. Block. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you folks primarily deal in projects that require all those millions in initial, in initial start of capital? Or like, what, what would be the range? That's, going to, that's a good question. The range of our investments are probably $250,000 to, realistically, if you do it just with us, probably about $750,000. We fund larger deals what we do it through syndication with other angel groups and even some VCs. Um, the largest that I've ever done was, a, well, was almost $4 million uh, for a biotech startup. And some companies need more capital than others. Uh, indeed, it's in our, to our advantage as angel investors not to, uh, to, to, not to have a company or not to want to fund a company that needs lots and lots of money because you're, not, you're only the first round. There's, you're going to have to have additional financing down the road, and generally that's called you get the, the investor gets diluted, so that the investment becomes worth even if it's an up round. You just you you have to make more money in order to make a, give us a better that's return. The point: How much when, when you agree on uh, to do a deal with someone, how much do, do you normally mandate be diluted into your share of the adverse? Oh well, that's a that 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 gets down to the most the, the most basic question of all. We call it valuation. Um, and every entrepreneur thinks his business is worth every, you know, a tremendous amount of money. We as angels think the business is worth nothing because it's a startup business. Uh, uh, generally, uh, the angel will want, I mean, the investor will, will the investor, the uh, entrepreneur will want a much higher valuation to start with than we do. There are two ways to solve it. You either do it our way 
Oh, I'm seriously, you either do it our way or you do it through what's called a convertible note, which delays the decision on, uh, uh, on valuation to a later date. Uh, that's becoming a more and more popular vehicle for early stage companies. But I always have a, I have a, I have a, I have a sort of a, a piece of advice I give to all entrepreneurs who are worried about the valuation, because the valuation means you're giving up so much of your equity, you're giving up so much of your control. You're going to give up the control anyway because there are all sorts of conditions in your agreements about what you can and can't do. Um, as, to the, as, to the, as to the amount of equity you're giving up, just think of, this, think of it this way. What would you rather have at the end of the day? 30% of a company that's worth $300 million or 100% of a company that's worth nothing or $5 million? If you, if you, if you, if you can get your ego out of the way, the answer is obviously pretty easy. See, I run into that all the time because um, right now it's very hard to get money uh, for companies who are looking to do equity um, in the lower end of the middle market. It's really, really tough to get that one, two, three million. I've got four or five companies out there that have receivables that are, you know, young companies. They're not early stage, obviously, because they have customers. And part of the issue that the owners face in trying to get that money is giving up. They've already put three, four years into the business and their heart and soul into it and their savings and everything. And they said, yeah, I can get that money from a PE firm, but they want 20 or 30%. I'm not, I don't want to give that up because I'm just on the cusp of maybe really realizing this, this business, maybe in you know, five, 10 years, and I want to retire or start another business. So that's a real issue right now in the market for those businesses. And I can think two right off the top of my head, and, and one of them was in one of these conferences. We went to the Lava Conference. Um, and it's heartbreaking because sometimes what happens is they just, I can lend to them, advance to them against the receivables, but they still need more money and they really go to family and friends many times to make up that difference because they won't take the piece of the company that, you know, they'll still just do a senior debt or subordinated debt situation. So yes, yeah, sub-debt is a way for some of the companies to do that in the later stages. And in both what Steve and Marianne is saying, and some a word that I want to throw out to the audience is uh, kind of, once again, going back from years of consulting, you really have to structure your financial funding plan for your company. And you have to structure that as the company grows. You know, in the companies that I've worked with, I've looked at all different options from getting angel investing to using some asset-based lending, some factoring and leasing and parts of it. Because once you get involved, even some of them that have been able to get a traditional bank loan, once they get into covenants, they're limited on additional funding. So um, what I'm trying to say is to open your minds when you start going down this road that you may have more than one answer. One answer might preclude others, and you have to plan for that. Question in the back? Uh, good afternoon. Rachel Williams, and I run the Executive Education Department here at Pepperdine. And for those of you that don't know, we actually have a pretty uh, groundbreaking research project that studies the private capital markets and the funding within those. So I encourage you to visit our website. It talks about the cost within each of these segments as well as other segments of the capital market. Um, but one of the, it, and we also have a certificate program that basically spends three days on this exact topic on how you get funding uh, for early stage middle market companies. Uh, but one, one of the things that comes up in that certificate program all the time is really what is the true cost? What's the most expensive capital, capital you can borrow? And I was hoping that each of the panelists could talk about what their true cost of capital is for their type of funding. And I know the answer, but a lot of people don't, so I won't throw it out there. <laughs> I mean, as far as what's the most expensive. Depends on how you. From my perspective, depends on how much, how much you, how much you have to give up to get the money. Uh, and generally, you're giving up for us to us between 15 and 25 percent of your company, uh, uh, of your equity. Uh, and and if you have to have money downstream, you're going to give up even more later. Um, so I, I, I mean, if you do fin if you do factor financing, uh, or or asset based lending, you're not you're not diluting your equity. So in a sense, I'm the most expensive money for that purpose, but, but I'm really the lowest cost because I'm taking all the risk <laughs> in that. You're just, you're just giving up part of your profits in the future to me. So if you do it on a discounted cash flow basis, I'm probably a, a, the cheapest of the three. It'd be my guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
spoken like a true what? issue. What? Sorry? Although it is factoring, because think about it, you're giving up, depending on your factoring arrangement, somewhere between 20 and 40% of your top line. Of your revenue, revenue. right. That's not true. Fred, I was going to say, Fred, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> it's not true. It just every it all depends on uh, it all depends on the amount of, uh, of loan there is. It all depends on who they're selling. Uh, everything depends on the actual business itself. So to say that it's going to be forty percent, or to to say it's going to be ten percent, you can't say. It's, it just depends on that particular business of who they're selling. It, it, going back to the clothing type of thing, if you're selling a Neiman Marcus or you're selling a Nordstrom's, someone like that, it, the cost is a lot lower than what it would be if they're selling a specialty store or someone that, uh, where the credit uh, would be uh, less apt to pay the bill. So consequently, it would be a little higher because it would take more for the, for the credit folks to approve it take more for the collectors to, to collect the money. So, it, so th that, that range is, is not an overall, you can't generalize. We're not taking equity. We don't want to be an investor. We don't want to be a partner. We just want to be your banker. That's it. Um, we had uh, somebody here, new question. Yeah, uh, my name is Armin. I wanted to thank all the members for uh, educating us about this topic. Stephen, um, I think this question is probably more pertinent to you. In addition to funding, what other resources? Excellent question. Excellent question. We, we, we mostly, we don't fund companies unless we get active in the company. Serve on the board, serve as advisors, counselors, adv 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 uh, mentors. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are we're an activist group. And we have access to additional capital. We have access to service providers like lawyers, accountants, uh, actuaries, uh, insurance agents uh, who can guide you. So yes, we are really an active involved. We have an active involvement in our company. So we talk about incubators and stuff. Is that the kind of environment? Well, we're not really an incubator. We're incubators is a very incubator is a very special animal because there's somebody who sponsors it, takes a piece of the equity, and then then holds a big auction at the end of the incubator period, and and you get funded. But the uh, that uh, we do incubators, but uh, and we have one that's affiliated with us, but it's it's a different process. Okay, we'll pass that back to you, Doug. Can we have a nice round of applause for our finance? <laughs>